The scrotum is ideally suited for evaluation by ultrasound because of its superficial location. We use high frequency probes of 7.5 to 15 megahertz frequency, and these probes are typically linear or curvilinear transducers. This is a transverse view of the scrotum showing the right testicle adjacent to the left testicle. It's important when evaluating the scrotum to take an image showing the two testicles side by side for comparison of echogenicity and size. And then to take a longitudinal view of, of the testicle as well. And this is a longitudinal view of one of the testicles showing homogeneous echo texture throughout the testicular parenchyma. We also look for the epididymis when we evaluate the testicles and the scrotum. The epididymal head, head sits at the superior aspect of the testicle, and its echogenicity is similar to the testicular parenchymal itself. Now the blood flow to the testicle comes via the testicular artery, and that artery provides a branch to the capsule of the testicle, which travels around the periphery of the testicle and gives branches into the parenchyma of the testicle that are called centripetal branches. So here's a diagram showing that the testicular artery extends to the scrotum, and then when it comes into the scrotum, it branches into that capsular artery that travels at the periphery of the testicle and gives off those centripetal branches to provide blood flow into the testicular parenchyma. With Doppler, we can evaluate the blood flow to the testicle, and typically we will see the capsular artery more easily than the centripetal artery, so we'll see flow at the periphery of the testicle. We may see scattered flow within the testicle itself, which are portions of the centripetal arteries. Typically, we see minimal flow inside the epididymis, less than what's seen inside the testicle. So here we have a transverse view of the scrotum. We can see both testicles, and we see f blood flow scattered throughout the testicular parenchyma. And on this longitudinal view, we can see up in this corner the capsular artery, as well as blood flow inside and scattered throughout the testicular parenchyma. One of the most important reasons we do ultrasound of the scrotum is to look for tes testicular or other scrotal neoplasms. It's important to immediately determine whether a mass in the scrotum is intratesticular, because those masses are typically malignant, or extratesticular, which are usually benign lesions. Testicular tumors are mostly malignant. The most common kind are germ cell tumors. About 95% of them will prove to have germ cell origin being either seminomas, embryonal cell cancers, teratocarcinomas, choriocarcinomas, or a mixed germ cell tumor. We also may find other malignancies inside the testicle, including Sertoli cell or Leydig cell cancers, or metastatic disease. So here's a patient who has a right testicular mass. You can see this lobular mass lesion in the posterior aspect of the right testicle. On this longitudinal view, we can see it's in the mid portion as well as the lower pole of the testicle. And this mass proved to be a seminoma. This patient has a more heterogeneous mass. It has some cystic areas, some hypoechoic areas, and some brighter areas. It also has a lot of blood flow, and this proved to be a mixed germ cell tumor. When evaluating for a testicular tumor, it's important not to let the patient's history deter you from making the diagnosis of tumor. That is, many patients present with symptoms and yet actually have a tumor. 15% of patients who actually have testicular cancer come in with symptoms of epididymitis and 10% have a history of trauma. So a quarter of patients with testicular tumor will be evaluated for symptoms unrelated to their tumor. So don't let the patient's history prevent you from making the diagnosis of a tumor. This patient came into the emergency room after trauma. His scrotum was scanned, and we can see normal parenchyma in the lower pole, but a hypoechoic area with calcification in the upper pole. <clears throat> it was questioned as to whether this was a hematoma, but it's not a hematoma. It's a teratocarcinoma. Now, testicular tumors typically have increased vascularity compared to the surrounding testicular parenchyma, and the flow in the vessels is usually low resistant. 
Unfortunately, benign tumors also have increased vascularity, so we can't use color Doppler to distinguish benign from malignant tumors. So here, for example, is a seminoma. You can see a hypoechoic mass in the testicle surrounded by normal testicular parenchyma. And you can see that the blood flow inside the mass is greater than the blood flow in the surrounding parenchyma. So it's hypervascular. In addition, when we put the Doppler gate over an artery that's traveling through that tumor, we see that based on the waveform, this is low resistance flow, typical of a testicular tumor. But here's a Leydig cell tumor. We see a well-defined hypoechoic mass in the testicle with surrounding parenchyma. Note how hypervascular this lesion is as well. So while this one was benign and the prior was malignant, both tumors had increased vascularity. We occasionally encounter metastases inside the testicle. These do look again like tumors because they're focal lesions. We may see leukemia or lymphoma. Sometimes genitourinary primaries will metastasize to the testicle. And rarely other primaries may be seen there as well. On ultrasound, we'll see a focal mass in most cases, but occasionally some of these metastatic lesions will be diffuse infiltration, particularly lymphoma or leukemia. So this patient has leukemia, and the left testicle was enlarged and filled with this hypoechoic region in the mid and lower pole. This represented leukemic infiltration of that part. Notice that the left testicle on transverse view appears larger than the right testicle, and also notice that the involved portion, the leukemic portion, is hypervascular compared to the normal right side. This patient has a gastrointestinal stromal tumor with a metastasis to the, scro to the scrotum. You can see in the, low, in the side of this testicle a well-defined mass here, and here it is on the still image. About 5% of intratesticular tumors are benign lesions. They, when they are benign, they're typically dermoids or epidermoids or Leydig cell tumors. Here we can see a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor that was benign, but has the same appearance as some of our testicular cancers. It's a well-defined lesion in the lower pole of the testicle. It does have some cystic areas, but mostly it's solid. On transverse view, we, we can see it has a lobular contour with a few cystic areas. And we can see how heterogeneous the mass is compared to the normal parenchyma of the left side and of the upper pole on the right side. This patient has a dermoid tumor. Fortunately, we were able to determine that this was a dermoid tumor prior to the surgery. Here you can see the testicular parenchyma is adjacent to this large mass. The mass is here and has an echogenic region with shadowing in the posterior aspect. This is sometimes called the plug syndrome due to a clump of fat or calcium inside the dermoid tumor. This was surgically excised, and you can see the hair that may be typically seen inside this, as well as that clump of shadowing, which represented a mass protruding into this dermoid tumor. An epidermoid tumor also may sometimes have a characteristic appearance, allowing us to make a diagnosis that the lesion is benign. Here you can see the typical swirling or onion skin pattern of this tumor well-defined lesion inside the testicle. The swirling pattern is typical for a benign epidermoid tumor. Now besides looking at masses inside the testicle, we look at the testicle for other reasons, including to evaluate the testicular parenchyma. And one thing we might see is microlithiasis. Microlithiasis are tiny little calcifications scattered throughout the testicular parenchyma. The prevalence is about 9% with the current ultrasound technology that we have. And this prevalence has increased since uh, a decade ago because our ultrasound transducers have improved. The risk of malignant tumors in patients with microl microlithiasis is eight times higher than those without microlithiasis. And typically, the tumors are more often germ cell tumors and more often pure seminomas than are tumors in patients without microlithiasis. And these numbers are based on a study we did of over 6,000 patients at Brigham and Women's Hospital. 
So here's a patient with bilateral microlithiasis. You can see on the transverse view that both testicles are filled with these tiny little bright echoes throughout the parenchyma. And a longitudinal view, you can see the entire testicular parenchyma was involved. And this patient also has microlithiasis, but developed a germ cell tumor. You can see the tumor centrally located inside the testicle. It's a hypoechoic mass. But you notice that the parenchyma around the testicle has microlithiasis. It has those bright echoes surrounding inside the parenchyma. Also notice the increased vascularity associated with the tumor. So if microlithiasis is encountered at an, at an ultrasound, what are the recommended what do you recommend to the patient? Well, most often it's recommended that the patient do self-examination to assess for the development of the tumor. Because although tumors are eight times more common in patients with microlithiasis than in those without, the risk of cancer is still quite low. A few have recommended annual physical exam or an annual ultrasound. And if a patient has a prior history of a testicular tumor, cryptorchidism, or a subfertility, those patients should have closer surveillance than just self-examination. Now, sometimes we encounter other lesions in the testicle that are non-neoplastic. These could, for example, be granulomata from tuberculosis or sarcoidosis. Rarely, adrenal rest tumors will be found. Sometimes we'll see cysts. And then we also look for other complications, such as torsion or infarction, or inflammation affecting the testicle or infection, or we assess the testicle after trauma. Granulomatous orchitis can be caused by sarcoidosis or tuberculosis and may present either with focal hypoechoic lesions inside the testicle or may produce diffusely hypoechoic testicles with enlargement of the testicle itself. So here's a patient with sarcoidosis. This patient had multiple hypoechoic lesions in each testicle. You know, on both sides, they were all similar in size and echo texture. And because of his history of sarcoidosis, the diagnosis of granuloma that was made. Cysts in the testicle are uncommon but can be seen. They may be single or multiple, or they may be tubular which turn, is the result of a dilated reedy testis. Most cysts are located near the mediastinum. They do tend to occur in older patients. And most of the intratesticular cysts are non-palpable. That's as opposed to the tunical cysts, which are on the surface of the testicle, which can be quite small, but still palpable. So here's a patient with an intratesticular cyst. You can see it's an anechoic lesion with thin walls on longitudinal view. And here we see it on transverse view. Notice that it's right next to the mediastinum testis, which is the area of a slight increased echogenicity at the edge of the testicle, the site where the vessels and, and tubules enter and leave. This is the most common location for intratesticular cysts. This patient had dilated reedy testis. You can see this irregularly shaped clump of cystic areas. These are dilated tubules at the mediastinum of the testis. You can see it here and here. These, this is most commonly seen in older patients and very commonly associated with an epididymal head cyst, as we see here in this patient who has a very large epididymal head cyst. And this is thought to occur as a result of obstruction in the epididymis, leading to backup into the testicle with dilatation of the reedy testis. Now the testicular parenchyma may suffer a vascular insult in one of two ways. It may undergo torsion, in which case the whole testicle is involved, or the patient may suffer a focal infarction. Testicular torsion occurs in those men who have a, clapper, a bell clapper deformity. That is, the bare area where the testicle is supposed to be anchored to the wall of the scrotum is narrow or small, allowing the testicle to swing on its stalk, obstructing its blood flow. The salvage rate after testicular torsion is related to the time since the beginning of the torsion. If the torsion is discovered and operated on in less than six hours, the salvageability of that testicle is excellent. From six to 24 hours, the salvageability declines, and after 24 hours, the salvageability of that testicle is quite poor. 
This is a patient who has a bell clapper deformity. You can see that there's a small hydrocele that is fluid in the scrotum around the testicle, allowing us to see the entire bare area for this testicle. And you can see it's quite narrow. This is the only attachment of the testicle to the scrotal wall. So this could twist on itself, particularly in the presence of this hydrocele. With testicular torsion, we'll see absent blood flow in the testicle, and we may or may not see the twisted cord. So here's a patient who has acute testicular torsion. You can see that the right testicle is slightly hypoechoic compared to the left, and that with color Doppler, there's no flow inside this testicle. It's important when looking for blood flow inside the testicle to optimize the color scale for very slow flow, which we've done here, setting it at two to minus two centimeters per second. And still we can identify no flow in the right testicle, whereas we see good flow in the left. After four hours, the testicle becomes enlarged and edematous. It may have decreased echogenicity. The echogenicity may become heterogeneous. We'll still have no blood flow inside the testicle. We also may see thickening of the epididymis or the knot of the twisted cord with the epididymis, and a hydrocele may develop after four hours. So this patient has acute torsion. Here you can see the left testicle is smaller than the right testicle. You can see blood flow inside the left testicle and no blood so flow whatsoever in the right. Also notice that the right testicle has all homogeneous echo texture but is slightly darker than the left and it's increased in size compared to the left. After 24 hours, we have what's called mistorsion, that is the, the torsion has blocked the blood flow to the testicle for more than a day. On ultrasound, we'll still see no flow inside the testicle, but we may now see thickening of the scrotal wall and increased blood flow in the scrotal wall. The changes in the testicle will continue, it may be enlarged or edematous, there may be hypoechogenicity or heterogeneity, the epididymis will still be thickened, and a hydrocele is likely to be present. So here's a patient with a missed torsion. Notice the nice normal left testicle with a thin scrotal wall. Here is the right testicle, it's hypoechoic, heterogeneous, and there's marked thickening of the scrotal wall as well as increased blood flow in the scrotal wall, but no blood flow inside the testicle itself. Now, occasionally patients suffer a focal infarction. There's, nobody knows exactly how this occur, but it does tend to be in older patients. And these patients present with acute pain. And what we'll see is either a wedge-shaped hypoechoic area at the periphery of the testicle, or we might just see a complex intratesticular mass. These masses are indistinguishable from tumors. So here's a patient who has an infarction. This patient did present with pain. We see a focal lesion at the periphery of the testicle. It's well-defined. It looks like a mass. The only thing about this mass is it doesn't have any blood flow, whereas the testicular parenchyma does. This was still concerning for malignancy, and so they did remove it, and pathology showed a focal infarction of this part of the testicle. This patient presented with pain and had peripheral lesions, as we see here and here. You can see them again on this view, and you can see there's no blood flow to them. The diagnosis at this time was thought to represent an infarction, so these lesions were followed. And indeed, six months later, you can see that they're much smaller. So these are resolving peripheral infarctions that had occurred six months prior. We still see a residual hypoechoic lesion. It does extend to the periphery. In one view, it is wedge-shaped. Scrotal infection can involve the epididymis. It can involve the epididymis and the testicle, or it can involve just the testicle. And we can see changes, depending on what kind of infection it is, on ultrasound. With epididymitis, there's thickening of the epididymis with increased blood flow to the epididymis. There may be a hydrocele, and there may also be an associated thickened spermatic cord. So here we have a patient with epididymitis. You can see that the up the epididymis sits above the superior pole of the testicle and in this case has a lot of blood flow. You'll recall I mentioned at the beginning that we typically do not see much blood flow in, in the epididymis in a normal patient. But when the epididymis becomes inflamed with epididymitis, the blood flow does increase. On this clip through the scrotum, we can see thickening of the epididymis here as well as a hydrocele. 
Now this patient went on to develop an abscess, which we see here. You can see that there's now a cystic complex fluid collection sitting in adjacent to the testicle here and here. This is an epididymal abscess that developed from the epididymitis. This is, does not happen too often, but it, it can happen, and ultrasound is a good way to monitor these patients. Here's a patient with acute epididymitis involving the tail of the epididymis more than the head. We see on this longitudinal view of the tail, uh, this was bilateral, and we see the longitudinal view of the left tail shows marked thickening and hypoecogenicity. Here it is on transverse, and here is the marked increased echogenicity. In addition, the right was involved as well with the tail, so this is a longitudinal view of the right testicle showing thickening of the epididymal tail. Some infections start in the epididymis and affect the testicle as well, becoming epididymo or chitis. In these cases, you have all the findings of epididymitis, but you also have abnormalities inside the testicle. You will see a hypochoic area in the testicle, typically at the periphery, typically in the region of the involved portion of the epididymis. There will be increased blood flow to the testicle as well as the epididymis, and the spermatic cord will be thickened. So here's a patient with epididymo or chitis. You can see that there's marked thickening of the epididymis. You can also see altered echogenicity in the right testicle on the clip as well as here on transverse view compared to the left, and marked increased blood flow inside the right testicle. Infections isolated to the testicle are called orchitis, and these are often different organisms. This can occur from tuberculosis, from mumps, or from retrograde travel of the infection from the lower urinary tract. When orchitis is present, the testicle will be increased in size with increased blood flow, and the echogenicity will be dis decreased either diffusely or in a heterogeneous manner. So here's a patient with orchitis. We can see when we look at the side-by-side -side view of the left and the right testicle that the right testicle is mildly enlarged. The echogenicity is pretty homogeneous, but it's not quite as smooth as the left. But when we put the color flow on, we can see how there's marked increased blood flow inside the involved testicle as compared to the normal left side. Look at all those vessels traveling across the inflamed testicle. Because of the scrotum's location, it is at risk for direct trauma. After trauma, a hematoma may be found in the scrotum. It may be in the epididymis. It may be in the scrotal wall. It may form a hematocele. In addition, the testicle may be damaged with a contusion or a rupture. So here's a patient who had a, an acute hematoma. The scrotum was markedly enlarged after trauma, and we saw this large collection in the upper portion of the scrotum. And here you can see that it's a fluid collection that moves with the ultrasound beam. The testicle was compressed inferiorly by this very large hematoma. This patient has a hematoma that is resolving, so it's been here for a little while. We can see that, that it, it has the typical web-shaped crisscrossing septations across it. This is a typical appearance of a resolving hematoma. Again, this is compressing the testicle inferiorly in this case. Sometimes, though, the tes testicles involve, so we need to look at the testicle carefully after trauma. With a contusion, we'll have hypoechoic or anechoic lesions that will have poorly defined margins. With a fracture, you get a hypoechoic band right across the testicle. And with rupture, there's disruption of the capsule of the testicle. Here's a diagram of what happens with testicular rupture. You can see there's a tear in the tunica albiginia, and some of the parenchyma is extruded through the gap in the tunica albiginia. It's pretty common also to have a hematoma associated with this. So here's a patient with testicular rupture. You can see this patient also has microlithiasis. This is the normal left testicle, and this is the right testicle. And just on this still image, we can see that the contour of the posterior wall of the testicle is bulging and distorted because of disruption of the capsule. When we look longitudinally, we see disruption of the posterior lower pole of the testicle with protrusion of some of the testicular parenchyma. And then if we look at the clip, we can see that region of extruded parenchyma through the defect in the tunica. 
this patient has a testicular contusion. Contusions can look like intratesticular masses and can raise concern for malignancy. Here we have the uh, well-defined lesion that's hypoechoic and heterogeneous. And so because of the, conf the fact that it can be confused, it's, this may sometimes come to resection. Also remember I said at the beginning that 10% of testicular t tumors, cancers, present with a history of trauma. So if this patient comes in and has this ultrasound where there's this focal hypoechoic lesion, we do need to raise concern that this could be a tumor. If they, if whoever's treating the patient wants to wait a little bit and see if maybe it is a contusion, close follow-up is recommended. Fortunately, with contusions, they do get better quite quickly. They get smaller in size rapidly. And sure enough, here's this patient who was followed monthly, but for nine months. And you can see by nine months now that contusion is almost invisible now on ultrasound, having collapsed down and resolved. Besides the testicle, we look at other things in the scrotum, including the epididymis, as well as the scrotal sac. So we look for fluid from a hydrocele or a varicocele or even a hernia. Epididymal cysts are spermatoceles that are typically located in the epididymal head, but they can be anywhere. They are focal dilation of the tubules that contain the sperm that they're carrying from the testicle in, and then into the spermatic cord. They're usually asymptomatic, but they may be palpable in some situations. So this patient has an epididymal head cyst. Here you can see the testicle is normal, but above it we see a well-defined cyst here and here located in the epididymal head. And as I said, they're typically anechoic with thin, smooth walls. Now hydrocele occurs because fluid collects between the visceral and parietal layers of the tunica vaginalis. These can be congenital, but often they're acquired either from inflammation or a tumor or a trauma, or they could be idiopathic. So here's a patient who has bilateral hydrocele's. You can see that we have very large scrotum with lots of fluid around both of the testicles. The testicles are normal, as we see here, with normal blood flow. Here again, we see one of the testicles here with a lot of fluid inside. And if you look carefully in patients with hydrocele's, you can actually see the appendix testis sticking off of the testicle. This is a good view, again, to show that bare area. This patient has a normal bare area with the testicle attached to the scrotal wall in this wide area. So this is not a bell clapper deformity, but a normal attachment. Varicoceles are dilated veins of pimpiniform plexus. Sometimes they extend into the testicle. They're more common on the left than the right, but are bilateral in 25% of the cases. They may develop from a retroperitoneal neoplasm, which obstructs the venous return from the scrotum. The pimpiniform plexus is the plexus of veins around the spermatic cord extending down into the scrotum. You'll notice that these veins drain into the testicular vein, and on the left side, the testicular vein drains into the, right, into the left renal vein, whereas on the right side, the testicular vein drains into the inferior vena cava. This is why if there's a retroperitoneal tumor, you may have a varicocele because that tumor may compress the testicular vein, leading to backup of blood inside the scrotum, causing a varicocele. The ultrasound findings in a varicocele are serpiginous tubular vessels in the scrotal wall. The diameter of these vessels is two millimeters or more, and we may see slow flow either with the grayscale or with color Doppler. So here's a patient with a varicocele. You can see that there are tubular vessels in the scrotal wall. Here, this one is measured or pointed to with an arrow. On the two-dimensional image, you can see flow inside these veins. It's very slow flow, so that you can just see it with the real time. And here we see flow that's been elicited by a Valsalva maneuver inside with color Doppler. And here's another one. We can see that there are lots of serpiginous vessels, but on the color flow, we don't really see that this is flowing because it's so slow that the, blood, that the color cannot pick up the flow. But if we just look at the grayscale, we can see these tons of serpiginous vessels with lots of venous flow inside them.